Good morning again. I've entitled the sermon today, Amazing Jesus. Open your Bibles to the um, New Testament Gospel of Luke. We'll be in Luke chapter 7, and then we're going to be in Mark chapter 6 today. Many years ago, and I mean many years ago, I was working at a grocery store, and, and the young men and women thought that it would be good on a Sunday, on a summer sunny day, that we should go to the local park and play some softball. And so Trish and I got there a little bit late. We were running a little bit late. And when we got there, the only position for me to play was out in right field. But because we were late, I got, uh, I got all my stuff. I had my shoes and socks hanging off my fingers. I had my 64 ounce Big Gulp Pepsi in my hand. That was my lifeblood in those days. And then I had my, my mitt, and I had my sunglasses. And as I'm walking backwards out to right field, because I'm watching the infield, the batter hit a ball. And he hit it big. It was up there. It was fast. It was moving away from me. And I thought to myself, there's no way. There's no way in, in the world that I can catch that ball instinct turned uh, turned on i threw on my glass i punched my hand into the glove it was the exuberance of youth <laughs> and i started running toward it and the closer i got to it the more i realized that i could never ever catch this ball on the ground so that's when I lifted up. I turned my glove. The ball went in it. My back was to the infield. I turned around all that, and I didn't spill a drop of my 64-ounce <laughs> Big Gulp Pepsi. I showed everybody the ball. They stopped the game. They stopped the game. They were trying to understand what they just saw. I don't want to brag or anything, but, <laughs> but they were amazed. So was I. Can I tell you another time that I was amazing? I was, I was in the downtown area of a particular city. They employed one-way streets. I really was not familiar. I was not accustomed to one-way streets. And pretty soon I found myself driving north on a southbound one-way street. And as I'm trying to avoid the cars, I look to my left and on the sidewalk there's a police officer. And he's looking at me because everybody's honking their horn at me. I looked at the police officer, he looked at me and I did one of these. I, I don't know, I don't know. Three minutes later, I found myself on that very same street, driving the very same direction, looking at the very same police officer. <laughs> I don't think it's a stretch to imagine that he was amazed at me. <laughs> How would you like to amaze Jesus? To be amazed is to be astonished or surprised. The word indicates a sense of wonder or marvel. But it's interesting that this word amaze can be used in the negative or the positive sense. We can use the word amazed in a critical way or in a sense of admiration. Would you like to amaze Jesus? Because in the New Testament, there are two ways to amaze Jesus. There are only two times in the New Testament that it records that someone amazed Jesus. One is recommended. The other is not. And amazingly, amazingly, both have to do with the topic of faith. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that you are the, the merciful creator, creator of heaven and earth. You are the one who formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed life into his nostrils. 
we acknowledge that Jesus Christ is your one and only Son, our Savior. And we acknowledge that the Holy Spirit is with us today. And so, Heavenly Father, these next 10 or 15 minutes, we would pray that you would open our eyes and our ears to hear what you want us to know. And Lord, we would be so grateful as to tell you thank you in advance for how you're going to teach us today. For we ask it in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Amen. Pastor J.R. read that, uh, that passage today about a centurion slave. When a centurion's servant was sick, when he was dying, this commander of 100 Roman soldiers asked some Jewish elders, can you go speak to that fellow Jesus? Tell him about my sick servant and ask him to heal my servant. And the elders agreed to go to Jesus. Jesus agreed to come to the home and heal his servant. And while Jesus was still on the way, the centurion had second thoughts. And he sent his friends with a different message to Jesus. Yes, the servant was still sick. Yes, the centurion wanted his servant healed. But now, now there's a new message in Luke 7, 7. And the words of the centurion, but just say the word, and my servant shall be healed. Do we understand that our God is not a God of zip codes, area codes, or time zones? Do we know what the centurion knew? That there's power in just one word from Jesus. There was a time that Jesus was in the region of Gerasenes. And there was a man there, his name was Legion. He had a legion of demons within him. And when this legion saw Jesus, he was afraid that they were going to cast the demons into the outer darkness. And so in Matthew 8, and the demons begged Jesus, saying, if you are going to cast us out, cast us into the herd of pigs. And Jesus said to them, go. Do we comprehend do we understand? Do we get it that Jesus Christ is able to cast out a legion of demons from one man with just one word? Go. There was a time that the disciples were in the boat crossing the sea and they looked up and they saw Jesus walking on the water. They were afraid and Jesus said, Do not be afraid, it is I. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus, Jesus said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. Do we understand that with one word, our Lord Jesus Christ commanded Apostle Peter, the only other man in the world to ever walk on water. It was one word. Come. And the centurion, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. This soldier's faith was great. He did not need an outward sign like the touch of of Jesus' hand. He did not even have to hear the voice of Jesus. This servant did not need to touch the fringe of Jesus Christ's robe. He did not need the shadow of Jesus just to pass over him. The word that Jesus spoke would be enough for the centurion. Just say the word, and my servant will be healed. Do we have a faith that can amaze Jesus? The centurion had an accurate view of Christ's power. Jesus could do nothing unless he was from God. And it could be that this centurion, maybe he was a little bit embarrassed that he had asked Jesus to walk all the way to his home. 
He believed that Jesus' authority was not affected by a geographical location. You see, this centurion, he knew. He knew what real authority was. Luke 7, verse 8. And the centurion said, For I also am a man placed under authority, with soldiers under myself. And I say to this one, Go. And he goes. And to another, Come. And he comes. And to my slave, Do this. And he does it. The centurion used example of his authority over other soldiers and other slaves. He assured Jesus that he understood what authority was. Just as Jesus used one word commands, so did the centurion. And I'm not sure that this centurion fully understood the nature of Jesus Christ's authority. But he knew what authority was when he saw it. And he was saying to Jesus, I know that you have authority. Just say the word from wherever you are. And my servant will be healed. Now when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. He was amazed at him and said, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. Jesus Christ acted according to the centurion's faith. And when his friends returned to the house, the servant had become well through the authority of Jesus Christ and the faith of the centurion. Do we use that same kind of faith today? Do we acknowledge the authority of the Son of God? And do we understand the character of the centurion? This centurion knew, he knew that Jesus wanted to heal. And we think, how, did we, how do we know that Jesus wanted to heal? There was a man with leprosy. He came to Jesus and he bowed down and he said, Lord, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus reached out his hand and touched him saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. How do we know that Jesus wants to heal? It's part of his character to heal men and women. And then the, the centurion knew that Jesus had the power and the authority to heal. In Matthew 9, 5, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing, healing every disease and sickness. The centurion understood that no one could have authority unless they themselves are under authority. And just like the centurion counted on the Roman government to back up his commands, he knew that Jesus had heavenly authority behind his commands. And we read this account, and it's another wonderful story in the New Testament. We see that the centurion understood the mechanics of faith. And according to Jesus, he understood faith like no one else in Israel did. And I look around me at 2024, and maybe this centurion understood faith better than we understand it in this day and age. It is an amazing thing that this centurion, this Roman soldier, that this Gentile has now joined a very exclusive list of men and women of great faith in the New Testament. There were two men who were blind. They were following Jesus and they said, have mercy on us, son of David. And Jesus said, them, said to them, do you believe that I'm able to do this, that I'm able to give you sight? And they said to him, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, we believe. Then he touched their eyes and he said, 
it shall be done for you according to your faith. It shall be done for you according to your faith. In Matthew 15, there was a Canaanite woman that came and bowed down before Jesus. She said, Lord, help me. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. And Jesus said, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. That is, it's not good to take the things that belong to the people of God and give them to others. And the woman answered, yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed off the crumbs of the master's table. She told Jesus, I'm not asking for a meal. I'm just asking for the crumbs. Then Jesus said to her, O oh woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as, your, as you desire. And her daughter was healed at once. O oh woman, your faith is great. How would you like Jesus Christ to say those words to you? And amaze Jesus. This Canaanite woman got her wish. Not because Jesus felt sorry for her. It was because she showed great faith. Great faith leads to great mercy. Amen? Amen. Say it like you mean it. Great faith leads to great mercy. Okay, now we're on the same page here. Yes, yes. When we have great faith, we see God's great mercy in our lives. Do we have that kind of faith that can amaze Jesus? Because there's another way. There is another way to amaze Jesus. Turn your Bibles into the Mark, the Gospel, verse, chapter 6. And Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and the many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man learn these things? And what is the wisdom that has been given to him? And such miracles these performed by his hand, is that not the carpenter, the son of Mary? the brother of James and Joseph, Judas and Simon, are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at Jesus. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not dishonored, except in his hometown, and among his own relatives, and in his own household. And Jesus could not do any miracles there, except he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he was... Ah. And he was amazed at their unbelief. And he was going around the villages teaching. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is coming back to his hometown, Nazareth. And he encountered a great deal of disbelief, even hostility from the people. He used the word dishonored. The people were offended that Jesus taught in their synagogue. They were astonished that a carpenter's son had so much wisdom, so much learning. They were insulted because they had heard about the hundred miracles that this hometown boy had accomplished. They could not explain him, so they rejected him. And Jesus could not do any miracles there except he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. He could do no miracles there, not because the power of God was weak. The power of God must be used with wisdom to show grace to those who believe. And our Savior understood that performing miracles there would be done without any salvation benefits for the people. And so he could not do wonders among these people. Jesus was ready. Jesus was willing to do great things for them, but because of their lack of faith, he could not. And once again, Jesus was amazed. And I, I don't get that. I don't understand. 
Jesus had to go to other villages to teach and do miracles. Villages that would listen and believe. And I think how much did these Nazarenes lose by their childish stubbornness against Jesus? Who could calculate the eternal blessings that they squandered? Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is this, that God created us for his honor so that we might reflect his glory. But there's a problem. We all have sin in our lives. And that sin lets us fall short from God's glory. And we are separated from God by our sin. And since we all have sinned, we deserve to be separated from God forever. And if you don't think you have sin, 1 John 1, 8, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If you do not think that you have sin, my Bible says that you are deceiving yourself. And yet, and yet in God's great mercy, he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die for the world, to offer eternal life for sinners. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This eternal life is a free gift to everyone who will by faith in Jesus Christ accept him as Lord and Savior. I mean, after all, Hebrews 12, 2 Jesus Christ is the author and the perfecter of our faith. The beginning, the beginning of our faith is Jesus Christ. And when all is said and done, it is Jesus Christ that makes our faith perfect. One final example. In the Gospel of Mark, in the ninth chapter, a man rolled up to Jesus and he pointed his finger in Jesus' face. He said, if you can do anything, take pity on us and heal my son. And Jesus' reply was soft, gentle. And Jesus said, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the boy's father cried out. And he said, I do believe but help my unbelief. There was a conflict between belief and unbelief, and that conflict between unbelief and belief continues today. But the choice between the two, this father chose wisely. He chose the better option. That is, he made the best choice. He chose to believe. How much would we lose what would we for, forfeit if Jesus was amazed at our unbelief? So what's the preacher saying today? Apparently, great faith amazes Jesus, both when great faith is present and he's amazed when great faith is absent. And this Roman soldier, he had great faith and Jesus did great things. A community of Jews had little faith. And Jesus did little things. And even today, every man, every woman is not exempt from times of doubt. And our prayer should always be, may God's grace deliver us from unbelief and move us into a faith that gives life to our soul. And because I think this way, I wonder if Jesus came into our church, why would he be amazed? Would he be in awe of our great faith? Would he be amazed at our lack of faith? It seems to me we are going to amaze Jesus Christ one way or another. Maybe we can amaze Jesus by a spectacular catch in the outfield. Maybe we can amaze Jesus by going the wrong way on a one-way street. Can we amaze Jesus by our great faith or by our lack of faith? Let's choose wisely. Let's plan to amaze him with our great faith.
God be praised.